of the Centre of Research Excellence in Aphasia Recovery and Rehabilitation. I'm Dr. John Pierce, a postdoctoral researcher here at the Aphasia CRE and a co-facilitator of this series with Dr. Sonia Brownset. <clears throat> Uh, before we do anything else, I'd like to acknowledge that this event and many of our participants are located on the lands of traditional custodians in Australia. So today I'm located on Wurundjeri land and we pay our respect to elders past, present and future and extend this respect to First Nations people joining us online. Today we have Alexi Siavonen joining us from Finland to discuss music-based interventions for aphasia rehabilitation. Um, we're really pleased to be hearing from Alexi, but before we do, I'm going to cover off on some brief points. First of all, you can connect with us on social media via Twitter and Facebook, and we now have a blog where you can read all of our latest findings and calls for participants for research. And you can subscribe to receive blog updates through email. And as always, please feel free to tweet along with today's seminar using hashtag aphasiacre. Please note that this seminar is being recorded for future viewing and the Aphasia CRE's YouTube channel contains past recordings. Today's seminar will be uploaded within um, a few days and you can subscribe to that YouTube channel to receive notifications about new videos. And with that out of the way, it's my privilege to introduce our speaker. Dr. Alexi Siavonen holds a, both an MD and PhD from the University of Turku and in 2018, his PhD thesis was the first in the world to form a systematic and comprehensive picture of the neural basis of post-stroke music processing deficits and their recovery. Dr. Siavonen is currently a resident in neurology at the Helsinki University Hospital and a senior researcher working at the University of Helsinki, Finland. And his research focuses on the neural mechanisms of language and music, as well as on their respective deficits, aphasia and amusia, and on their recovery. Dr. Siavonen's areas of in expertise include music-based interventions in neurological rehabilitation, especially on post-stroke rehabilitation, a subject on which he has published over 11 articles, including a review of the topic published in Lancet Neurology in 2017. Dr. Siavonen has also worked with Professor David Copland and his team at the University of Queensland since 2020 on predicting and promoting aphasia recovery. Dr. Siavonen has a multidisciplinary background in neuroscience and clinical neurology and combines clinical neurology, neurological rehabilitation, neuroradiology, cognitive neuroscience, neuropsychology, and music psychology in his research. <clears throat> Altogether, Dr. Siavonen has authored 31 peer reviewed scientific papers and eight book chapters. So, welcome, Dr. Siavonen, and thank you for presenting today. I'll um, hand over screen sharing to you. Okay, I'm going to just share my screen. Wonderful. Okay, so um, good morning, everybody from Finland. Um, I'm almost exactly from the um, other side of the globe. And um, thank you for the invitation and uh, introduction, of course. Uh, it's, it's really nice to have this opportunity to talk to you. And um, I said today we will be talking about music-based interventions in aphasia rehabilitation and um, I'm trying to have the point of view how music can be used as a cognitive verbal and neural rehabilitation tool for aphasia. So the outline for today is here. Uh, first to get us started um, I'm going to go through some background information on music and the brain and then we will move on to talk about stroke recovery and rehabilitation in general. And lastly, how music can be used as um, an aid to aphasia rehabilitation. So first about music and the brain. So music is and has been present in all known human cultures and its importance to us humans is undeniable. The earliest musical instruments found in ar archaeological excavations date back more than 40,000 years, and music is thought uh, to have been a very important factor in our evolution, as singing is thought to have been one of the earliest means of communication. And it's been even suggested that singing um, has preceded and helped the development of language. Finnish research uh, has shown that newborn babies 
um, recognize the songs they have heard on, on, uh, or their mothers have sung during the last stages of pregnancy, even four months after birth. In general, uh, newborn babies recognize musical structures such as chords at the brain level. And before learning how to speak, the prelinguistic toddlers, they move rhythmically to music. So regarding the relationship between music and language, both are synthetic systems employing complex hierarchically structured sequences built using implicit structural norms. And studies have shown that the brain mechanisms for synthetic processing are partly shared between music and language, comprising, for example, Proclus area in the left hemisphere and the ventral ordinary stream in the right hemisphere, which is crucial in interpreting rhythmic melodic acoustic information in both music and language. And lastly, research on human auditory processing just suggests that musical training benefits the neural encoding of speech. But back to music. I'm gonna close this. Uh, this. Yep. Um, since music is um, of great importance to us, it's reasonable to expect that our brains have evolved to process it in a very specific way, similar to, for example, the neural circuits supporting language processing. And in fact, music is processed very extensively in the brain. In the first stage, the structures of the ear convert the sound wave into nerve impulses, which pass through the brainstem and deep parts of the brain to the auditory cortex. In these structures, the basis, uh, basic features of music, such as pitch and duration, are observed and processed. Even more complex musical structures, such as comparing the pitch and different sounds and rhythm are dealt with in the temporal, frontal, and occipital lobes. Following the music in time, on the other hand, requires memory and attention and engages related neural structures in the temporal and frontal lobes. During music listening, we also try to identify whether the music or its pieces are familiar to us. Musical memory is related to traditional memory areas, such as the hippocampus, prefrontal cortex, and single. Other frontal temporal brain regions are also needed. Playing, singing, and moving to the beat active activate the motor network in the brain, including the cerebellum and the primary sensory and motor cortices, as well as the basal ganglia. And simply listening to rhythmical music has a similar effect of activating these brain areas and the motor circuit. Music also evokes emotions and causes pleasure by increasing the secretion of dopamine, for example, and brain structures such as amygdala, nucleus accumbens, and ventral tegmental areas are all active, active during listening to rewarding music. If one picture tells a story with a thousand words, then one video might be worth a little bit more. So I think this is a better way to introduce us to how the neural processing of music uh, works and how active is it and how, um, uh, how it engages our brain. So here's the video published by our fellow researchers from uh, Uvascula. Finland, and it, it's revealing the real-time wide processing um, brain, of brain activations in healthy subjects while they're just listening to music in an MRI scanner. And in this video, the red represents increased activity and blue represents a decrease in the activity. So let's take a look and listen.
<clears throat> so practicing music, be it playing or singing, um, is an extremely demanding activity for the brain. So it involves the cooperation of sensory, motor, cognitive and emotional brain areas, as we just, just saw. And logically, the musical practice induces neuroplasticity in these structures and improves the functionality of the connections between them. And in particular, uh, these are um, now prominent in the temporal lobe, especially in the auditory cortex, as well as in the sensory motor and frontal cortices. Next, uh, we will move to discuss stroke rehabilitation. And during an acute stroke, the normal function of neurons is disrupted and structural damage and eventually impairment of motor, sensory and cognitive functions occur. Although neurons that have highly specific fun functions are lost in stroke, uh, spontaneous functional recovery takes place, at least partially. In fact, already within hours after the onset of stroke, uh, a cascade of plasticity and enhancing mechanisms lead to dendritic growth, axon sprouting and the formation of new synapses. Most of the recovery occurs within three months after stroke onset, but recovery may take place even many years after the initial brain injury. However, it must be noted that if a patient has a notable impairments at three months post stroke, it's likely that the patient will exhibit permanent sim symptoms. The time after stroke here is uh, often divided into phases, as you can see. Um, the rationale behind this differentiation is that recovery related processes um, post stroke are time dependent. For example, in hyperacute and acute phases, edema, edema and inflammatory responses resolve and improvement of function begins. Regardless of the impairment's nature, uh, the initial severity affects the recovery potential after stroke. That is, the patients with mild initial deficits make on average better recovery than patients with severe deficits. If you look at this principle using functional MRI during an upper extremity task, which is here grasping um, and the maximum grip strength, um, the greater damage leads to greater functional activation deficits and the poorer recovery potential. A panel here presents fMRI activity maps associated with movements of the periodic hand at different time points post stroke. Recovery of hand function is associated, associated with fMRI signal increases early after stroke, the latter returning to levels observed in healthy controls with good functional recovery, as you can see. A stronger recruitment of the controlational hemisphere is more likely to occur in patients suffering from more severe initial impairments, as you can see in the panel B. In other words, the milder the deficit, the more similar the fMRI activity is, but in more severe deficits, the fMRI activity tends to spread outside the dedicated brain areas and network due to initial larger damage, disinhibition, and compensatory mechanisms. The similar pattern can, pattern can also be observed in aphasia. The upper row represents healthy controls activity during a language task, and the three lower rows represents aphasic patients with different time points post-stroke. At the acute stage, the brain activity is increased, a decreased in language related areas due to the damage and observable language deficit. However, after the acute stage, the initial decrease in brain activity during the language task ameliorates most efficiently in patients with good recovery potential and the fMRI activity maps return to comparable level to healthy controls, both frontally and at hemispheric level closely resembling the normal activity of the language network. So why does this happen? If we focus on the left hemisphere and aphasia in the dual stream model of language processing, the dorsal language pathway, which is represented here in red, connects the superior temporal, inferior pari parietal, and posterior inferior frontal areas. The ventral language pathway, which is here represented in green, connects the temporal lobe to inferior frontal regions. The two language pathways interact with regions engaged by ex uh, executively demanding tasks across multiple domains, which is here in blue. Damage to different parts of the model generates the variety of observable aphasia subtypes. In the panel B, the damage to the dorsal pathway was simulated and the model exhibited con conduction aphasia. Initially, the virtual language pathway remained unchanged. 
However, in the panel C, a partial recovery was simulated and these simulated recovery uh, related changes altered the division of labor across the pathways. In addition uh, to returning the remaining computational resources to the damaged dorsal pathway, the ventral language pathway became engaged by the repetition task, which is denoted here by the brown and green arrow, which was not the case in the intact model. If we shift our focus out of the left hemisphere and into the right hemisphere, um, the right hemispheric white matter path uh, tracks support language functions and more importantly are associated with aphasia outcomes. In the upper figure, we can see that the right hemisphere white matter tracks at the early subacute stage as well as specific parts of the corpus callosums um, are positively associated with longitudinally improved comprehension abilities in aphasia. However, um, in longitudinal production abilities, it was the opposite, meaning that greater connectivity in the right hemisphere tracks was associated with decreased longitudinal production ab abilities in aphasia. These results underline that right hemisphere white matter pathways can support recovery of language, especially comprehension abilities, but the domain may be critical for the involvement, depending on which hemisphere you are, which hemisphere is supporting the language recovery. So what does this all mean in terms of stroke rehabilitation? In the adult brain, damaged neurons do not regenerate despite few specific areas in the brain, meaning that neuro, uh, neurogenesis has most likely no clinically meaningful impact on recovery. This means that the recovery relies upon the spared neuron's ability to compensate for lost functions by growing neurites and forming novel synapses to rebuild and remodel the injured networks. In other words, the injured network tries to mend itself like darning a hole in a sock. This mending relies on the brain's ability to mold itself via neuroplasticity by forming new connections, similar to learning and re its related plasticity. Mechanisms related to neuroplasticity are activity dependent, meaning that the firing of one neuron repeatedly produces firing in another neuron, which, is connect uh, which it is connected to leading to the notion of plasticity as a behavioral adaptation that is associated um, with a change of function at the level of synapses. Plasticity regards also connecting the activation, uh, correcting the activation patterns as we saw in aphasia and, and in the hand grip uh, in cortical areas, which neurological therapies try to produce. Growth promoting factors and newly formed blood vessels can help with augmenting nutrient supply and repair processes to facilitate neuroplasticity change. Um, advanced functional neuroimaging has helped us to understand the underlying mechanisms of functional recovery from a neurological deficit, as seen in the phase out results earlier. Uh, the suggested mechanisms of cortical functional reorganization are very in fact in a reorganization recruitment of ipsilational or control regional cortex, changes in interhemispheric interactions or bihemispheric connectivity. Active rehabilitation treatments might improve the neurological deficit mediated by one of these above mentioned mechanisms. The favorable responses are thought to be achieved in tra traditional rehabilitation strategies by targeted training of the weakened function but this rarely affects other functions. That is, there is rarely a transference effect to be observed. An alternative strategy would be to increase the overall activity of brain and through sensory and cognitive stimulation. For example, in the enriched of, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, in enrichment of the environment or music-based interventions, for example. And these would tap into the increasing activity dependent neuroplasticity. Unfortunately, there are real life issues in promoting stroke re recovery. According to multi-center studies, even in specialized rehabilitation centers, um, stroke patients typically spend 50 to 70% of the day alone and inactive in their beds. Only 15% of the stroke patients who need therapy receive it, and those who get rehabilitation receive only 50% of the recommended amount. Moreover, the therapy is predominantly given after the critical subacute stage when maximal brain plasticity occurs. Moreover, the absolute numbers of stroke deaths and disease adjusted li uh, life years are still rising because of higher life expectancies and population growth in most countries. 
within next decades, these numbers are predicted to increase significantly around 35%. Currently, most post-stroke deficits, including aphasia, are considered network disorders. That means spatially distributed lesions can cause the same symptoms as seen in the panel A. Um, these lesions map to a shared functionally and structurally connected network as shown in um, panel B and panel C. This network can be, for example, the language network or a motor network or a cognition network. Therefore, while the stroke lesions are confined by the vasculature of the brain and might cause only focal damage, they induce disturbances in the functionally and structurally connected network as well as the related impairments, resulting, for example, in the same uh, deficit. If you see here, um, there are two different stroke lesions here um, in red, and blue is the respective affected structural network. This is just a visualization. It doesn't mean that the whole network is equally um, affected, but as you can see, the brain is very interconnected. So these structural and functional disturbances are then reflected to the post-stroke impairments, further complicating recovery and rehabilitation. While the most prevalent consequences of stroke is motor impairment, that is paresis, which affects approximately 80% uh, of the patients, more than half of the acute stroke patients demonstrate impairment in one or more cognitive domains with a mean of three impaired domains per patient. One third of stroke result in aphasia, and of the stroke survivors, two thirds have been demonstrated to have some neurological impairment and disability five years after the initial stroke. And half of the stroke patients require intensive and long term rehabilitation. So, rehabilitation should always fit the big picture. For example, if we think how aphasia can lead um, either directly or via secondary effects to reduction of patients' quality of life. First, stroke can cause uh, other associated cognitive deficits outside the language domain, which may interact with the language impairment, uh, exabit, uh, um, increasing the secondary effects. Therapies can be targeted at the aphasic impairment itself in hope that it will also improve any secondary effects and ultimately quality of life. However, therapies targeting these multiple domains might treat any associated cognitive impairments, secondary effects, and aphasic impairment itself. Okay, now we can move on to discuss music in aphasia rehabilitation. During the last 20 years, music has attracted uh, increasing attention in the rehabilitation of neurological diseases. Reasons for this are, as we have previously discussed, the prevalence of neurological diseases, their disab disabling nature, the related costs, and the limited resources for rehabilitation. Music is an example of a cheap, easy to implement, and safe element of rehabilitation that can be used from the acute phase to the chronic phase and largely without major healthcare resources. And music has already found its in place in the stroke rehabilitation guidelines of the United States, Canada, Great Britain, and Finland, for example. And during the last decade, significantly more research funding has also been channeled into the research of music-based rehabilitation. For example, the NIH has established a separate funding instrument for music medicine, and the Finnish Academy of Finland has chosen the University of Helsinki as the center of excellence. So while our focus on here is on aphasia rehabilitation, we have to start from the pioneering work that was conducted by Professor Teppo Sarkama in, um, at the University of Helsinki in 2004 to 2007. And it, their team evaluated the efficacy of music listening in post or cognitive rehabilitation. And the study involved 60 acute stroke patients who listened to music for an hour a day for three months after the stroke. The control groups listened to audiobook for one hour per day, and there was also a standard stroke care and rehabilitation group as well. The study showed that from the acute to three months post-stroke stage, music listening enhanced to recovery of verbal memory and focused attention more than audiobook listening or standard care. The effects were maintained at the six months longitudinal follow-up. 
music listening also improved mood at a more than standard care from acute to three months post-stroke stage. The patient's brains also began to function differently. During an MEG recording, patients from the music group responded to music more than the other groups after the rehabilitation period. And the strength of their neural responses was associated to improved verbal memory as well. The music listening intervention also changed the structure of the brain. The music listening group increased gray matter volume in frontal areas more than the other groups. And these changes were connected to the observed cognitive and language outcomes. These favorable cognitive and language and neural changes are related to the brain spared ability to process music despite the stroke. Here we can see how music listening activates the brain compared to the resting activity in a sample of 45, 41 acute stroke patients. As a comparison, the activity induced by audiobook listening is more focal, as you can see on the lower figure. And if you try to remember how, it, how the music listening activated the brain in the video, this is more or less the same initial skeleton or the core areas that the music activates, despite the patients being stroke patients. But the next question is then, does the type of music matter? In the same sample of acute stroke patients, listening to vocal music activates larger bilateral areas in temporal, frontal, and subcortical regions than listening to instrumental music. If this is the case, uh, would daily listening to vocal music be then more effective than instrumental music um, or audiobooks for cognitive and language recovery or inducing structural and functional neuroplasticity? In 2013, we set out to recruit another cohort of stroke patients that were pooled together with the patients from the previous Helsinki study to evaluate the efficacy of vocal music listening in stroke rehabilitation. The study involved 83 acute stroke patients who listened to either vocal or instrumental music for an hour a day for three months after the stroke. The control group was then an audiobook group. Vocal music listening improved language skills more than audiobook listening from acute to three month post stroke stage. And this effect was purely driven by the patient, patients with aphasia. Moreover, vocal music listening improved verbal memory more than audiobook listening or instrumental music listening from acute to three months and six months post stroke stage. Vocal music listening also increased gray matter volume in the left temporal areas and white matter volume in the right medial parietal areas in aphasics more than audiobook listening from acute to six months. From the Turku cohort, we also acquired diffusion MRI imaging as well as functional MRI imaging. And these showed that vocal music listening increased the structural and functional repair recovery of the language network compared to listening to audiobooks. More specifically, the changes were observed in the left frontal aslang tract connecting procas area and the premotor and motor cords, cortex, as well as in increased activity in the left premotor and motor cortex during listening to vocal music. These changes were associated with the improved language skills and verbal memory. Vocal music listening intervention also resulted in resting state functional connectivity changes in the language network correlating with the improved verbal memory. In other words, the functional changes of the vocal music interventions were, uh, intervention were both uh, specific to listening vocal music and observable as neuroplasticity changes at the network level. The structural connectivity changes after vocal music listening intervention were not confined just to the language network. Based on the whole brain white matter analysis, daily listening to vocal music after stroke improved white matter integrity in multiple left and white matter pathways, more than audiobook listening from acute to three month stage. Okay, now let's focus on the singing based rehabilitation of patients with aphasia. So patients with aphasia can retain the ability to sing melodies and lyrics of a known song and produce speech through singing, even if their spontaneous speech is very, very impaired. The first scientific article uh, about this phenomenon was published in Sweden in 1745. And the article describes a farmer's son who spontaneously became severely aphasic and could only speak yes or no. However, uh, the farmer's son was still able to sing familiar hymns in the church choir and produce complete words and sentences while singing. 
as an example of this, I will present a one patient of uh, one of our own uh, projects. And at the time of the study, she was uh, 71 years old and she had uh, had stroke more than five years ago. And she was very um, severely chronic, uh, chronically aphasic, as you can see, and was only able to produce single words spontaneously when asked to describe the picture. And let's first hear how she describes the picture here. Me. Boo. <laughs> Me. Me. So. Okay, so boo means tree, and that's the only correct information unit she can produce there. And now, in contrast, let's listen how she sings Brother John. That's a marked difference. So, Previously, the neural basis of spirit ability to sing words uh, in aphasia has remained very unclear. And however, very recently, we did a study that combined white matter connectometry together with very comprehensive and naturalistic appraisal of verbal expression during spoken language production and singing in a sample of 45 individuals with post-stroke aphasia. Our results revealed that both spoken language production and singing are mainly supported by the left hemisphere language network and protection pathways. However, while the spoken language production mostly engaged dorsal and ventral streams of speech processing, singing was associated primarily with the left ventral stream. So these findings um, explain why speech and singing seem to share the, the same core uh, neural circuitry within the left hemisphere, while there are some distinctions, meaning that why can we have patients that are severely aphasic and still can sing, and on the same time, we have patients that are severely aphasic and, and, and even can't sing. So that's observable, clinically observable as well. So studies have also shown that patients with aphasia repeat and recall song material better than the same material spoken. Um, patients with aphasia also show better learning of new linguistic material, that is stories via sung than spoken. And overall singing supports the motor production of speech on several different levels. It has lower production rate than speech that improves speech intelligibility. Singing re requires uninterrupted sound production that in turn helps to connect syllables and words together. The rhythm helps to combine sound and motor production and the melody serves as a mnemonic uh, when recalling words. The most research um, form of singing-based rehabilitation method in aphasia is melodic intonation therapy, or MIT. And MIT was developed in the 1970s in Boston and uses melody, mel melody rhythmic pacing, vocal expression, and in unison and alone, left-hand tapping, formulaic and non-formulaic verbal utterances, and other therapeutic elements in a hierarchically structured protocol. An example of the intonation and structure is being presented in below. There are four proposed mechanisms for MIT. So first, neuroplastic reorganization of language function, activation of neuron, neuron system and multimodal integration, utilization of shared and specific features of music and language, and motivation and mood. So the main steps of MIT are humming, where therapists and patients hum the melody of the target phase together, and unison intoning, where therapists and patients intone sing the target phase together. Unison intoning with fading where the therapist gradually fades in toning, patient continues. An immediate and delight repetition when the therapist intones and patients repeat. And shifting to speech-like intonation where the therapist gradually intones with speech and patient repeats. And finally, the response to probe when the therapist asks a question and the patient responds with a spoke, spoken phrase. So I have a example of a Dutch video of MIT to get a better idea. Good afternoon, 
Avondbuurman. Goede 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 avondbuurman. Nee. Goede avondbuurman. Goede avondbuurman. Goede avondbuurman. Goede avondbuurman. Goede avond. So the main limitation of MIT is that large-scale RCTs are lacking. However, a meta-analysis of for the published RCTs show that MIT has small to moderate treatment effects for functional communication, repetition, naming, but no treatment effects on comprehension. Uh, Group-based singing interventions may have additional emotional and social benefits, uh, reducing depression, for example, and loneliness, and increasing participation beyond what is achieved in an individual reha a level of rehabilitation, as usually seen in a clinical setting. However, only small-scale pilot studies have been published that indeed have reported that choir interventions can have positive, positive um, psychosocial effects and possible functional communicative effects, and that choir singing is acceptable and safe for patients with aphasia. So in Helsinki, singing and aphasia study, our aim was to develop a multi-component singing intervention for patients with aphasia that would combine choir singing and MIT adapted for group, group level training to target both communicative and psychosocial outcomes. We also wanted this to benefit both patients as well as their caregivers and support their interaction to reduce caregiver burden and to facilitate the translation of practice functions to everyday life. Furthermore, we aim to determine the efficacy of multi-component singing intervention on communication and speech production, emotional social functioning and caregiver well-being, chronic aphasia as well as the related neural benefits. So for this, 54 patients with chronic aphasia and their family caregivers were recruited. And at the baseline, we carried out comprehensive assessment of verbal and cognitive skills, structural and functional MRI, as well as a um, bunch of questionnaires. Uh, we then used a crossover randomized control trial designs where patients were randomized to two groups uh, who received a four month singing intervention either during the first or the second half of the study in addition to standard care. And at five and nine month stages, patients were reassessed with the same tests and questionnaires as well as MRI scans as in the baseline. The four month intervention comprised weekly set sessions of group based training that included 60 minutes of choir singing by a choir, um, led by a choir conductor. The final session of the intervention was a concert for family and friends that promoted goal oriented training. And here's a little video clip from that concert. So remember that all of these persons have chronic aphasia.
three sessions also included 30 minutes of group level melodic intonation therapy led by a music therapist where the patients practice formulaic everyday phrases. And here's a little demonstration out of a final session. And this is not exactly the same thing that they did, but this is just to demonstrate how they did it. And in addition, um, the intervention included home-based tablet-assisted singing training, where the patient practiced the songs that they uh, sung, sung, on the, sung in the choir. And the patients were trained in using the tablet and then instructed to train the song material themselves three times a week and 30 minutes per session. And compared with standard care, um, the singing intervention improved everyday communication and responsive speech production from baseline to five-month stage. And these changes were sustained also longitudinally, meaning from baseline to nine month stage. Additionally, the intervention enhanced patient social participation and reduced caregiver burden. The singing intervention was also associated with neuroplasticity changes. Compared to standard care, the multi component singing intervention enhanced structural connectivity in the left arcuate fasciculus, corpus callosum, and bilateral frontal last lung tract superior longitudinal fasciculus and corticostriol tract. Moreover, the singing intervention increased gray matter volume in the left inferior frontal gyrus and premotor cortex. The observed longitudinal uh, structural connectivity improvements in the left frontal aslan tract and as arcuate fasciculus, as well as the increased gray matter volume in the left inferior frontal gyrus correlated with improved naming abilities. So what's the take home message from all of this? Music, especially listening to vocal music and singing are promising tools in stroke and aphasia rehabilitation. Music listening could be utilized in both acute and chronic stages of recovery in stro stroke units, rehabilitation centers and outpatient clinics and at home. Music and singing can aid cognitive and verbal as well as neural recovery after stroke. And both music and singing could be used to support traditional rehabilitation methods, especially when the resources are limited. However, further studies are still needed to determine the optimal dose and efficacy of combination therapy approaches, etc. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alexi. It's, um, it's fascinating to, to see just a different approach, you know, as a speech pathologist and as aphasia researchers, we often take a particular angle. So, um, you know, obviously music has uh, different networks perhaps and different uh, way of treating aphasia and obviously for many people carries a lot of meaning as well. So um, thank you for presenting that very thorough work. Um, we're just going to have some questions uh, from the audience, which I'm sure they're typing out right now, but to start with my own um I'm wondering what sort of qualitative feedback uh, you had from participants in your study. You know, obviously you've got some excellent quantitative results, but um, what were their thoughts? Um, meaning the singing, singing or the music listening or both? Uh, the the choir and MIT study. That okay. You... Yeah. So um, I'm going to use this as a platform to just like incorporate some of the clinical feedback that I have gotten when when the rehabilitation center patients have um, received singing based therapy or they have had a day that there was a music therapist and they sung together. So for me, um, severely aphasic patients, when they even realize that they have an avenue left that they can produce words at a little bit more effective le level than just like spoke connected spoken language and they can they can um convey some emo emotions it's a, it's a magical moment for them mm. that they can realize that they still have the, the capability to do, do this and it means that it, it gives them hope and it gives them an avenue to yeah to share emotions and and experience something together so that's the power of of having a group-based intervention 
when mm-hmm. we're alone in a clinical setting and we're there with the doctor or speech pathologist or occupational therapist, physiotherapist, we're just there and we're focusing on ourselves as well. And it's not for everybody, meaning that the rehabilitation has to be individually set. So you have to have the individual goals and individual motivations as well. But for some of us, it might be very good to see people in the same same situation uh, share the uh, feelings that we have and the feedback that we have gotten from the from the studies is that um, that some of the patients feel when they sing that they can speak even though they mm. are not visibly getting visibly speaking more and and the caregivers said that the when they they sang together they found some hobby to do to, together with the with the with the patient and they and they had some kind of goal, which was um, like sneaking the, uh, the speaking therapy in it. So that's the that's the crucial part of rehabilitation. That um, the modern uh, framework for rehabilitation is not that the patients are, go somewhere and receive therapy. If you mm-hmm. understand what I mean, it's yeah. it's it's a rehabilitation framework built around the patient, so that the patient is in the center, and we try to find the critical motivations that the patient wants to do. And I think that's that was the biggest thing reflected in the in 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 the feedback that everybody was very motivated. To sing, of course, that drives the bias in the in the studies that we have a um, scientific study that you have aphasia and do you want to sing in a choir? So nobody that doesn't want to sing in a choir comes there. So everybody who comes there want want to sing in a choir, of course. Right. Yeah. But that's the same but, with any study. <clears throat> yeah. Exactly. But for music listening, most of the people who are listening to music in acute settings, even in a clinical setting or in our previous studies, they find it found that the music is somehow disconnecting from the uh, them from the very cold and clinical hospital mm-hmm. world at least for that moment yeah so that yeah yeah thank you um we've got a comment from Catherine rampant uh music brings a huge amount of support for many problems that people face especially stroke and aphasia many years after my stroke and aphasia i am still improving that's Catherine. And Bridget Noble, uh, bone conduction headphones, she wants to know whether they've been investigated um, for music listening, perhaps. Can you Uh, repeat, please? uh, She was just asking about bone conduction headphones as opposed to normal headphones. Were they used in your study? Perhaps have they been investigated? No, no, they're just normal. But I think that any means of getting the patients to um, listen to we had not in the study but in 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 the hospital setting we in in a real world clinical setting we tried to investigate that uh, um, like music pillows for example because mm-hmm. some, sometimes they are so paretic and and uh, hemiparetic and they are in the other side of the um they are facing a wall for example and then they have to turn um and so they had musical pillows and we have tried in Turku, um, this sort of um, ceiling speaker that's like directing the music. It's it, you cannot you cannot hear the music from from one mm-hmm. meter outside the beam, so mm-hmm. to speak. So it's not distracting anybody else. But those are pretty pretty um, expensive. So I think that the headphones and and is 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 the best best way to go right now. But everything that if you need to have bone conducting right. headphones or anything, just yeah. yeah. Any, anyway. I, yep. Yeah. Um, Nelson Hernandez asks, uh, you mentioned there was reduced caregiver burden in the last study. What measurement was used for caregiver burden and what was the caregiver's role in therapy? Yeah. Uh, the caregivers were uh, part, but uh, they participated in the um, uh, MIT, meaning that they were there uh, and they practiced the formulaic phrases. So it means that the first, the uh, uh, music therapists they they practice the MIT and so so the music therapist sort of uh, gave the ball to the caregiver so they pr- continued practicing th- that together so they became um, so they sort of became uh, a- an active part of the rehabilitation as well mm. and the caregiver were were not part of the choir but they were sometimes present but they didn't take part in the choir if but they were not uh, disallowed to uh, 
take part in the choir if some of the patients felt that it would be more safe and comfortable if someone would take that. So um, for the, it's Sarit Burden interview, if I remember correctly, that A-R-A-T, Sarit. Sarit, okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, um, that must be it, yeah. Thank you. Claire McKenzie is asking, as a director of an aphasia choir, is there any way they can help contribute to this important research? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that we would need to have um, we would not need to have a very very large scale study of different aphasics in a choir setting, and 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 we need to have more research on how the different severities of aphasia if they respond differently to the prior mm. and i think they our patients practice 20 songs and two of them or three of them if i remember correctly it was two of them were novel and 18 were like familiar songs for them and i'm not getting into this but i have a very strong feeling that it's a very different thing to sing the familiar lyrics and the, uh, practice a new novel song and that's more related to of course learning and other cognitive domains but of course it's more related to probably kind of improvising speech so to speak that you have to connect the different words and you have to learn it and so so it's a very different thing and just semantically trying to capture the right framework yeah. that you have learned since you were a child for example so i think the interesting thing would be to have a study so that we would shift the focus on very very novel songs mm. and we would yeah so that would be an ideal but it would need need to be very carefully thought out so that it's not just the patients who have the capacity to learn yeah. new songs or verbal material but it would just be if it in, in in an optimal world it would be translatable to their speech as well yeah, I, I have had yeah. um, someone with aphasia who was in a, a music group tell me that, you know, singing songs they already knew was, was that freedom of feeling like their speech was back to normal, but learning new songs they personally felt was, um, you know, helpful for their language. Yeah, and, um, and, it, and, and, and even if you would just sing familiar songs, if, if you think about that you have lost, you have dysartria, for example, on top yeah. of aphasia, it's it's always helpful for, for, uh, for the patients to um strengthen their larynx and muscles and 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 everything so that they the dysarthria might ameliorate or if they have a very severe apraxia of speech they might benefit this um like singing based therapies differently so but that's something that we haven't looked into and yeah is yeah so there you have some ideas <laughs> yes uh, we've got a lot of questions coming in actually um okay Fanny Eckhart asks, in the music listening study with the audiobook control group, what was the answer to the question of what kind of music was played for the participants? Their preferred music or? Yeah, they, they, they we had a very, 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 very large pool of music, not a Spotify, but a real MP3. Mm -hmm. Back in the day, real MP3 pool. <laughs> yep. So, uh, and we had a music therapist that went through with the patients um, um, according to their group allocation that if they were in a vocal music group, they tried to find the correct uh, music and the, um, the preferred music for that patient that include vocal music. So, mm. and they, and we have a large pool of, of, of audio books and whatnot and instrumental music as well. So that's the idea. And, and every week the music therapist was in contact with the patient and asked that, okay, uh, are you satisfied with the music or do you want to change something? And then they met up and changed like, two thirds of the song and kept one third of the songs and yeah, yeah. so it's preferred music and, and I think that the, and I think that preferred music in a clinical setting is the safest bet that if you want to play if you want to have some kind of positive effect in a clinical setting you need to try first uh the preferred music for the patient and and if that's not uh easy to attain from the patient you ask the caregivers or the family that what might be the music that the patient uh, enjoys and likes and yeah. Right, because it's it's not just having music on, is it? It's it's active listening. I'm assuming. Yeah. 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 Okay. And were they given instructions on how you know how to listen, or was it just just instructed to focus on 
um, it's it it was instructed to listen to one hour per day and and in a environment that the music was the primary focus. Right. But some of the patients um, uh, started shifting, not all, but some of them started shifting so that they uh, they, for example, did some kind of physical uh, exercise, walked, for example, while they were listening because they felt that the music was somehow more easily. Uh, they they listened to the music more easily then because they weren't so mm. relax they couldn't relax so so well that they could just listen to one hour and and sit in a chair for example yeah so, gave them some yeah. Keep yeah. Yep. yeah but we wanted it to be a little bit that was the um that was the instructions but we didn't want to make it very strict that you have to just sit there and listen to the music but active listening is more precise than just listening to music yeah um, Alan Bernstein Ellis asked what type of changes were observed in the communication activity log? Was this uh, outcome filled out by the care partner or the individual with aphasia? And are there other measures you'd like to see included to measure outcomes? Yeah, the uh, it's CAL and CIS communication, and it's both self-reported and caregiver reported uh, because this was part of the <clears throat> our one of our PhD done by Sinitouli Siponkoski. I'm, this is the level that I remember from the top of my, my head. So if you need to have a very specific details regarding those, just hit me up an email and I will answer you. But Collins is communication and both self-reported as well as the family caregiver report. Yeah. yeah. Um, we might go a little bit over if you've got just a few minutes more, Alexi, or? Yeah. This is just a lot of questions. So yeah. uh, Beck, what's asking, are there other examples of group MIT being used in research and has that been compared to individual before? Not that I know. Yeah, not that I know. Okay, so quite novel. Yeah. And of course, choir singing is a very, um, it, it's a choir, it's a, it's a group setting, of course, that's how you do a choir. But I think group-based is, mm, as a clinician also, I think that the, because we we would like to rehabilitate everybody, but that's that's not the way it goes, unfortunately, in the real world. So I think that if we if we can come up with with um, evidence that there is a um, a group of patients that benefit from group based therapy, mm -hmm. and they don't need so much individual therapy. For example, if they would receive individual therapy at some points, and they they would have group based therapy. Um, that would be very cost effective and mm. that would be more more um, probably beneficial for the whole healthcare system as well. So I think that's the way to go in the future, not for getting the individual therapy, but trying to figure out group based therapies that would be effective and supporting the other traditional methods. And I think that for those uh, therapies, the group based therapies, I think the the people who sit on the treasure chest they would be more inclined to open the treasure chest and fund that those, that kind of rehabilitation activity rather yeah. than just increasing the individual therapy um, amounts and yeah yep so it's quite an attractive um funding yeah. proposition yeah, yep. exactly. um leanne carry out uh, says thank you for an excellent and sustained body of work in this field i was struck by the activation of um somatosensory areas insula precuneus thalamus through to cerebellum interested in potential for accessing this connected network in the context of somatosensory recovery any thoughts okay oh that's a very good thanks leanne uh i have to think about that i think that the the there is a lot of um data that there's data that we can utilize differently from our studies and probably we haven't yet looked into all possibilities and in stroke patients i think that the only issue for us would be to have not enough patients to be divided uh, according to their like lesion size and location meaning that we have a very like in the real world we have very different uh, focus of the lesion and lesion volume and whatnot so that's the real world uh, side of the study but for example if we would 
want to be very strict and want to show something, it would be really nice that we could um, categorize the patients differently. And then we could be able to look into different. Oh, oh I lost that's a mark. I'm yeah. Not enough. yeah. Okay, <laughs> so the the idea that we could categorize the patients differently and we could uh, look into different network uh, adaptations in these patients, it would be that would be the optimal way. But if yeah. you can come up something with Le Leanne, and if you have some kind of idea, just let me know, and I can look into our data if if we if we can if we can do this. Hmm. Uh, final question, um, Katarina Breitenstein. Singing skills vary in the general population. Does it matter for aphasia rehabilitation success whether the patient is a good singer to begin with? No, uh, no, uh, none of the. None of the participants that we had in any of the music studies, either listening to music or singing or or whatnot, they are not professional musicians. I think probably two or three out of the altogether 150 patients that we have had in these studies are probably um, have, uh, have practiced music more longer than 10 years, but still at the hobby level. Mm -hmm. So it means that there are some studies I'm going to I'm going to flip this around. There are some studies that if you have a very strong musical background and you get stroke, you don't get um, you might not get so severe amusia like music processing deficit mm -hmm. after the stroke if you have a very strong musical background, which might be related to the fact that you have a very strong network of processing and, and then the labor is very kind of divided mm -hmm. into different um, and it's uh, it's optimized. Yeah. Yeah. Distributed. Yeah. And um, but for example, in our patient study, in our amusia studies, we couldn't find that effect, and 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 we had the largest sample. But it it might not be the case that it's not true. It might be the case that we don't just have the the variability of musicianship in our data. Right. But uh, for the intervention, it's um. It's good that we don't find any of these. We, we cannot find any that some of them that have um, less errors while singing Brother John or less rhythmic errors while singing or they have better music perception, for example. We don't find this, that they respond differently to mm -hmm. the therapies. I think, unfortunately, it is very, um, it's more related to the fact of the initial deficit of the stroke and the aphasia and whatnot. And they have the same limitations than other uh, rehabilitation strategies as well. But music is something that you can still utilize why you couldn't move, for example, your hand so that it would engage the idea of moving, as Leanne said, that the engagement of the motor area. So that's something that can tap into the motor cortex and activate the motor even though you cannot move the hand so well so that could be used in in, in addition to physical therapy for example but that should not be related to musicianship as well so mm. yeah thank Good you and so, sorry to the other uh, people asking questions we've, we've run out of time and comments in there too but um thank you dr siavonen for your presentation and we um, everyone's quite are looking forward to any future work you're doing in this area so thank you again just a note on our next seminar, we're hearing from um, Associate Professor Dana Wong, who will be presenting to us on enabling meaningful participation in activity within people who have cognitive and communication difficulties. And that seminar is coming up very soon on Wednesday, August 30th. So please see our blog or social media channels for details on how to register. Thanks very much. We'll see you then. Thanks, Alexi.